Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime event on the political life of an epidemic, cholera, crisis and citizenship in Zimbabwe, written by Professor Simakai Chigudu. My name is Wes Williams and I'm the director here at Torch, where Medical Humanities is one of our headline programmes. So it's an extra special pleasure to be introducing this event today. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Chigudu today to speak about this book. Also on the panel are Dr. Jan Schubert and Professor Sloan Mahone, who will be chairing the discussion. In a moment, I will hand over to Professor Mahone, who will fully introduce the book and the rest of the panel. This will be, I'm sorry, I clearly covered my camera. I'll, uh, I hope you can see me now. Um, in a moment then, I will hand over to Professor Mahone, who will fully introduce the book and the rest of the panel. This will be followed by a brief reading by Professor Chigudu, and afterwards our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We will then give Simakai the chance to respond to some of the points raised before, interest, uh, before entering into what promises to be a fascinating discussion. The event will then conclude in the last quarter of an hour or so with questions from you, the audience. We'll try and wrap things up by two o'clock. But do put in your questions into the chat box as we go through, and I will pick them up and feed them back into the discussion at the end of uh, today. It's a great pleasure then to be here to introduce this first book at lunchtime of term. Book at lunchtime is, as regulars will know, Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. Do look at our website for the full programme for the rest of term. And all that's left for me now is to do to introduce our chair and to thank the rest of you for coming. Our chair, Professor Sloan Mahone, is Associate Professor of the History of Medicine at Oxford University. A specialist in the history of psychiatry and neurology in Africa, as well as the history of medicine and psychiatry globally. A current research projects funded by the National Institute of Health Research and the James Martin School here in Oxford, involve the implementation of oral history programs on epilepsy in Africa and in resource poor settings globally. She's a member of Oxford's Epilepsy Research Group, and she's also worked extensively in historical research and community development in Zaire, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zanzibar. Sloan, uh, a great welcome to you. I'll now disappear from the screen and leave proceedings to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be um, invited to chair and, to, and invited to take part um, in introducing um, uh, this wonderful book and launching it, I suppose. Um, and in my role as chair, uh, first let me introduce um, uh, our both my co-panelist and also our author. Um, let me start with Professor Simukai Chigudu. I've known Simukai for a number of years now. Um, and uh, as he was uh, mentioning a little bit earlier, uh, have seen the sort of development of this um, project in this book uh, as it's come along over the years. Um, Simukai is Associate Professor of African Politics at Oxford and also a fellow of St. Anthony's College. Prior to academia, he was a medical doctor in the National Health Service, where he worked for three years. He is principally interested in the social politics of inequality in Africa, uh, which he examines using disease, public health, violence, and social suffering as organizing frameworks. He's conducted research in Zimbabwe, Uganda, the Gambia, Tanzania, and South Africa. Welcome, Simakai. Um, also, I'd like to introduce um, my co-panelist, Dr. Jan Schubert. Um, Dr. Schubert is a Leverhulm Trust Early Career Fellow at Brunel University. He is a political and economic anthropologist working on state institutions, infrastructures, and transnational trade in Angola and Mozambique. He is the author of Working the System, a Political Ethnography of the New Angola. Uh, and has previously held postdoctoral research posi positions at the universities of Leipzig and Geneva. Welcome to you as well. And um, now, without further ado, uh, I will turn over to our author, uh, who will uh, start a reading uh, from his book. <laughs> 
Um, thank you very much, Sloan, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Torch, for inviting me to, to share this work. In August 2008, the impoverished high-density townships of Harare's metropolitan area were engulfed by a devastating cholera outbreak. The epidemic quickly spread into peri-urban and rural areas in Zimbabwe before crossing the country's borders into South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, and Mozambique. Over the course of 10 months, the disease infected over 98,000 people and claimed over 4,000 lives with an exceptionally high case fatality rate at the peak of the epidemic. And thus, Zimbabwe's 2008 cholera outbreak has been deemed the largest and most extensive in recorded African history. Now, epidemiologically, the outbreak can be explained by the breakdown and cross-contamination of the city's water and sanitation systems. Yet such a reading belies the complex interaction of political, economic, and historical factors that initially gave rise to the dysfunction of the water systems that delineate the social and spatial pattern of the outbreak and that account for the fragmented and inadequate response of the national health system. And cholera then was not only a public health crisis, it also signaled new dimension to the country's deepening political and economic crisis of 2008, which brought into question the capacity and legitimacy of the Zimbabwean state. In this book, I'm not seeking to address the cholera outbreak as a technical problem to be solved or to be prevented in future. Indeed, there already exists a rich epidemiological literature speaking to this very question. Instead, this book is about the political life of the cholera epidemic. It examines the epidemic's origins, the patterns of its unfolding, its social impact, official and communal responses to it, and its aftermath in civic and public life. Across different institutional settings, competing interpretations and experiences of cholera created a series of charged social and political debates about the breakdown of Zimbabwe's public health infrastructure and failing bureaucratic order, about the scope and limits of national and international agencies in the delivery of disaster relief, and about the country's profound levels of livelihood poverty and social inequality. And so examining the political life of this epidemic offers compelling insights into politics, humanitarianism, social inequality, the state and citizenship in Africa. This book sets out to answer three principal questions. The first, what were the historical and political economic factors that account for the origins and scale of the cholera outbreak? Through this question, I explore how the cholera outbreak maps onto a dense and complex political history of the establishment, transformation, and disruption of urban order in Harare. Such an analysis sheds new light on changes in Zimbabwe's bureaucracy, on the country's contentious urban politics, but also on the co-constitutive entanglement of both the material environment, such as the capital city's hydraulic infrastructure, with social arrangements, such as how people live in, manage, and negotiate urban space. Second question I ask is how do different organizational entities, communities, and individuals act in response to the cholera outbreak? Through this question, I explore how one disease, cholera, gave rise to many different crises, thereby engendering multiple and often competing experiences of the outbreak as well as multiple and often competing modes of addressing it. In effect, cholera took on a variety of forms depending on where and by whom it was encountered. Cholera's fraught politics emerged from the multiple crises it engendered and from its embeddedness in extant political conflicts and social relations. Third, how has the cholera outbreak been committed to historical memory and what political subjectivities has the epidemic generated? Through this question, I explore the myriad memories and meanings that cholera has left in civic and public life. I uncover these meanings from the stories that people tell about the outbreak. I consider why these narratives take the form that they do and I examine what political subjectivities these stories reveal after such a marked period of social suffering. Now, 
Cholera as an indicator and a test of social and political systems has occupied a central place in much of the non-medical literature on the subject, and it provides a guiding thread that runs through the book. The historian Richard Evans, in his groundbreaking history of cholera in Hamburg, in the latter part of the 19th century, advocates the study of the disease in this manner, but, rife, but rightfully cautions that we need to be very careful and circumspect in, our, in handling this way of approaching cholera. In Irvin's survey of the literature on the great cholera outbreaks of Europe's Industrial Revolution, he notes a tendency among historians to ascribe to cholera the power to bring social breakdown or to reinforce social stability. He notes, for instance, historical accounts of the 1832 cholera outbreak in Britain, in which it is argued that cholera did not usher in social breakdown, but instead acted as a stimulus to a whole range of sanitary reforms, to a series of transformations in the administration of public health, to the initiation of major schemes of slum clearance, and to long-term improvements in housing and living conditions. While expressing admiration for such studies, Evans critiques the analytical imprecision with which such terms of social stability and breakdown are invoked. Moreover, he argues, and I quote, it takes a lot more than an epidemic to cause the destruction of a political and social system, or for that matter, to radically transform it. Social transformation, stability or breakdown are always a matter of politics. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Simakai. Um, and uh, now um, I will respond uh, and then I'll call on um, Jan Schubert to give his response as well, uh, followed by um, more commentary by Simakai. So when I read uh, the political life of an epidemic, um, one of the things I did, and I'm interested that um, Simakai chose to engage with Richard Evans, a quite an important medical historian. Um, I pulled out a couple of quotes that kind of resonated with me. Um, and I overall, I want to talk a little bit about um, maybe four different themes that occurred to me throughout the book. But to start with these first two quotes, um, one is from another medical historian, Charles Rosenberg, in his book, Explaining Epidemics. And he writes, quote, only when the presence of an epidemic becomes unavoidable is there public admission of its existence. Bodies must accumulate and the sick must suffer in increasing numbers before officials acknowledge what can no longer be ignored. The pattern has repeated itself in century after century, end quote. And then another quote that struck me, Richard Bourne from his book, Collapse, What Went Wrong in Zimbabwe, he writes, quote, no one in 1980 could have predicted that Zimbabwe would become a failed state on such a monumental and tragic scale, end quote. Now I thought that these two statements sit um, in interesting parallel to a third very simple sentiment from the preface of a political life of an epidemic, and that is that cholera is, quote, easy to prevent, difficult to spread, and simple to treat, end quote. The implication here and throughout this book is that cholera's appearance, and most certainly when it's at scale, is always about something else. The second thing I'd like to note, and historians of medicine, as well as political scientists, medical anthropologists, epidemiologists, and so forth can tell you that disease profiles may have marked characteristics, but they also change. The Ebola virus was for decades considered catastrophically deadly at nearly 100% mortality within outbreaks, but it's also inefficient in terms of what a virus wants to do, which is to survive. It's virulence causing it to burn itself out before spreading throughout the population. In recent years, however, this has changed with outbreaks now occurring outside of Zaire or DRC, where we first came to know about Ebola, and also affecting greater numbers of people. We also started to see some people survive it. HIV AIDS, while devastating to pandemic scale, is slow acting in an individual and is often invisible. 
However, its significant association with stigma has shifted drastically over the last few decades as options to manage the disease have improved. Historical afflictions such as TB are much less in our consciousness now than when we think of the 19th century, but the numbers today are staggering. Approximately one quarter of people on the planet are infected with the bacillus and tuberculosis. We've simply learned to overlook it. Diarrheal disease is still a major killer of children under five in resource poor countries, including many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. High levels of infant and child mortality are not bound to a single infectious agent. They are always associated with much broader structural inequalities. And taking a cue from Paul Farmer, James Ferguson, Barnett and Whiteside, and the study of cholera in 2008, we see these potential disasters working in tandem with highly specialized but short-term quick fix mentalities. Do mosquitoes cause epidemic or endemic malaria? Or perhaps the parasite within the mosquito? Or what about a lack of roads or the failure to send girls to school? The strength in the political life of an epidemic lies in the multiplicity of ways we may come to know the epidemic of 2008, even as we grapple with the assertion, as Simica writes, that it was not inevitable. Cholera is easy to prevent, difficult to spread, and simple to treat. Uh, the third thing that struck me was uh, the ways in which tensions of modernity are also interwoven throughout the book. And, I've, and this plays out in a number of ways, and I've, I've pulled out four here. First, the silencing of a disease that is associated with filth, poverty, a lack of development, and backwardness. Cholera lagging behind only worse associations for Africa of famine and genocide. Um, to this, I might add leprosy as a, a list to the list historically. Secondly, Stark assessments of cholera as medieval and the contrast with how diseases, quote, in this day and age ought to be handled by the state suggest a tendency to periodize epidemiology. This, I think, is a very unstable notion. How else are we to view global structural inequality as anything other than modern? Thirdly, modern Public health success stories such as ORT or oral rehydration therapy are heralded as lifesavers, obscuring the fact that the necessity for ORT on any large scale is first and foremost a story of neglect, deprivation, and injustice. And lastly, I thought a surprising limitation to the oral history methodology in the book is seen in an apparent lack of openness about seeking traditional treatments or medicines stigmatized in some quarters for being anti-modern. This medical pluralism, which might be the norm and neither modern nor anti-modern in neighboring countries, was an anathema in Zimbabwe, where the narrative of a post-independence model of stability and progress was all too recent. Ultimately, studies of disease and epidemics illuminate a multiplicity of what we might call at stakes. And I couldn't help but uh, think back to a, a, a film that I love called Rashomon, which is about, uh, it's an Akira Kurosawa film about um, a traumatic event and four different perspectives remembering this event and recounting what happened. And of course, they're all uh, wildly divergent as um, versions of the truth. So what was an at stake in Zimbabwe in 2008? For some, national sovereignty, for others, claims of authenticity and modernity? Was it raw power or the sanctity of a welfare role for the state? Even a wildly competent but zealots approach to intervention becomes an at stake. And here, uh, I think Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Frontier does not come off uh, particularly well. All of these at stakes complicate the failed state narrative that oversimplifies approaches across the, uh, the continent, a narrative that Simukai rejects here. Perhaps most importantly, while we address the perfect storm of what went wrong, we also come to understand how ordinary Zimbabweans, quote, staked claims to medical treatment and social welfare, end quote, which in itself is a story of how people enact their citizenship. The political drift 
from an ethos of professionalism, education, and skills in holding political posts to one of loyalty might sound familiar to anyone watching American politics during the last four years, even as we enact our own rights and responsibilities amidst a global health calamity that ought not to have unfolded in the way that it has in this day and age. The political life of an epidemic is both a macro and a micro history of high politics and deeply intimate stories, a way of explaining epidemics yet deeply close to home. Thank you. And now I'd like to uh, call on my colleague, Jan Schubert, to give his response. Thanks very much, Sloan, and thanks, Simkai, and thanks, Torch, for having me here. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, having the privilege to discuss this great book. Um, I really enjoyed reading this. Um, it's extremely well and beautifully written, and it's very engaging. And the thing is, I don't work on health, so um, there's a lot in it. Uh, obviously, it is centrally about cholera, but there's a, it's a political ethnography of a specific moment in recent Zimbabwean history. Um, and there's a lot in it uh, for people interested in the African states in general or in political anthropology. And, you know, your analytical approach, uh, the political stance with which you approach this and the critical conceptual vocabulary you deploy in the book um, all resonate a lot with my own work uh, in an experience of Angola. For example, the critique of neo-patrimonialism, with which I sympathize enormously, of course, uh, but also the idea of cholera and cholera response as a political terrain upon which competing uh, narratives are played out or negotiated. And this all revolves around the central question of political subjectivities under conditions of authoritarianism or a dominant party system, if you will, how these are produced and reconfigured by the experience of dramatic events, such as in your case, this cholera outbreak. So I'm myself a, a lapsed historian currently working on infrastructure, um, and I really appreciated your long durée perspective on infrastructure politics in Harare. Uh, this reveals the contingency and path dependency of the for formation of specific differentiated infrastructural publics, the paradoxical effects of a post-colonial politics of orderliness in urban planning, as well as the historicity of certain explanations and interpretations of the outbreak that your informants mobilized at the time of research, the parallels to biological warfare by the colonial regime, for example, the maintenance of order and the modern town center, the hostility towards informal settlements. You then trace in your second chapter, the, Zimb the decline of the Zimbabwean health system to structural adjustment in the 1990s. And it, it's interesting for me to see in your descriptions, parallels to Angola where similar chronic underfunding results in very comparable shortages of even the most basic supplies, gloves, sterile dressings, needles, and even clean water in hospitals. But in the Angolan case, SAPs are not centrally to blame, rather it is more directly the result of elite predation on public funds. So, for the Angolan case, I'm currently working on a piece, working to my way towards an argument about how the, the moralizing language of neoliberalism, talk of efficiency, responsibility, and the proverbial tightening of the belt is deployed to justify largely self-inflicted austerity measures. Moments of crisis, as your book shows, also provide a fertile ground to advance through neoliberal rhetoric, agendas of capital capture, cloaking them in the mantle of commonsensical reasonableness and national solidarity. And I'm not saying this to let the IMF off the, off, off the hook or brush under the table real problems such as hyperinflation, but rather to raise questions about agency and complicity in these dynamics of underfunding, which often go hand in hand with predation which we can also observe maybe in the dismantling of the NHS in Britain, all in the name of sensible spending or the hidden debt scandal in Mozambique at the moment. So my first question reading the book uh, is whether your material could also contribute to making uh, a larger argument about austerity. Your likening of this history of underfunding and structural neglect to a time bomb is evocative and also reminded me of Rosa Fitchek's idea of a a hurricane bomb in Puerto Rico, how a history of US imperialism and imposed austerity produced the conditions for disaster when Hurricane Maria struck in 2017. 
And one of your key arguments in the book is that what you term the multiple ontologies of cholera precluded a shared understanding of the outbreak and its causes. And this has implications not only for humanitarian assistance in a situation of crisis, but I think more broadly and profoundly for our understanding of the multiple and shifting nature of citizenship and by extension of statehood beyond the specific Zimbabwean or generic African case. And this brings me to a further question that we could perhaps discuss afterwards. Might this idea of multiple political ontologies be a way to apprehend polities that are so deeply polarized and fractured that they no longer appear to seem, uh, that they no longer seem to share the same reality? Um, your chapter four then charts the assemblage of institutions and actors that together forge the response to the humanitarian crisis. A processual understanding echoing for me the idea of arenas developed by Hagman and Peclar, and which allows you to raise questions about the political dynamics that emerge from these negotiations and interactions. And I was really intrigued by your analysis of how depictions of bodily suffering uh, very often in quite gruesome terms, were mobilized as a moral narrative to justify the imperative to do something. You tell a story about the challenges of coordinating a humanitarian response um, from crumbling government buildings that haven't seen running water or stable electricity in years. Moreover, and this is something we know from other situations of emergency, you show how the immediacy of interventionism precluded addressing more fundamental structural and political issues. And so your material also speaks volumes about the dilemmas faced by national and, and international NGOs in the context like, like Zimbabwe's or, or Angola's for that matter, where apolitical service delivery to make up for the shortcomings of the state's own services is accepted or even welcomed, but anything political is suspicious or even actively impeded. So I wonder, also in relation to your final empirical chapter where the anger of citizens is palpable, whether in your assessment, this kind of ostensibly apolitical activity might not also provide spaces for people to experiment with governance at very local levels, which could eventually, possibly, lead to the development of new political subjectivities formulated around the substantive expectations of citizenship. And perhaps, though that goes beyond this, the scope of the book and calls for speculation of how these substantive expectations might be changing now in the post-Mugabe area. Finally, in your conclusion, you open up to parallel with the 2013 to 16 Ebola epidemic. And the obvious question is now, might there be any insights from your book that you see as relevant and translatable to other contexts in our current situation of a global pandemic? Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, and now I'd like to uh, invite our author to uh, give his comments in response. Um, thanks so much, um, Sloan and Jan, for that. I mean, that's um, such rich and generous and thoughtful readings of the book and, and, and very, very deep engagement with, with my arguments. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll just comment, I guess, uh, in a slightly freewheeling way on some of the things that just stood out to me. Um, Sloan, I really loved your um, uh, kind of emphasis on the tensions of modernity that play out throughout the book. And in some ways you've, you know, captured it kind of more precisely uh, than, than, than I was, fully able to, because I, I kept thinking um, as I was researching and writing the book, reflecting on my own background as a Zimbabwean. You know, I was born in Zimbabwe and I grew up there, but I left the country at age 16 at around the time that um, the country's politics were convulsing, questions about the colonial past, um, about the one, well, the de facto one party state, uh, about the rise of an opposition, all collided with each other um, to create a period of, you know, in my lifetime at that stage, unprecedented uncertainty about the nature of daily life. So to kind of concretize that idea, um, you know, growing up, we lived a pretty comfortable uh, middle class life. 
Um, and there was a kind of sense that the only country in, in Africa that was more developed than us uh, were, were our uh, colleagues south of the Limpopo in South Africa. And there was this kind of period almost of a reversal or of change that happened in 2000 as the kind of confrontations that I detail in the book began to play out. And they kind of touched on everyday life in many different ways. One of them was through this intimate sense that um, we were experiencing uh, a disorienting shift in the nature of history and in the trajectory of the country, one that we struggled to articulate at the time. And it was experienced initially as a, as a sense of stasis that somehow Zimbabwe had been on an inexorable march towards progress, development and modernity that then for various political reasons was briefly put on pause, but would eventually resume. That of course is not quite what happened. Um, the conflicts and the economic crisis continued to play out. And then as a young man watching the cholera outbreak unfold while at medical school, um, I was met with this jarring image of how could a country that I had grown up in that had prided itself on its sense of being development succumb to such a basic infection. And so the, that tension of modernity was, uh, for me, had a kind of narrative, even phenomenological quality. It was very much a part of how I understood the country and my relationship to it. Um, and I was trying to translate that because I think I saw that mirrored as I was doing the research in um, the range of social metaphors and discourses that we use to talk about the country. You encounter it in schools, you encounter it in hospitals, you encounter it um, with activists, and you also encounter it in government bureaucracies. A constant and relentless sense that um, time has been suspended, but that this is an impermanent and influx state of affairs. Um, looping that kind of observation from when I was writing the book to a comment that Jan made towards the end um, about the post-Mugabe era is that it kind of felt when Mugabe was, you know, ousted from power through a military coup in November 2017, that this protracted period of crisis and stasis was coming to an end, at least superficially. Uh, and it was kind of signified through a form of social catharsis as people were celebrating and flooding the streets of Harare. And yet the regime that has followed um, has been just as bad, if not worse, than what preceded it. And I think in kind of telling that story, one of the things about the kind of cholera outbreak is how cholera both became kind of emblematic of that in an idiomatic sense, but also how it shows the, the kind of sheer biological human kind of character of um, political and economic decisions. Um, and also challenges any taken for granted sense about where we are at any given moment uh, in history. Um, and I think that that does bear a parallel that's hard to think through about the present pandemic. Um, I think it's invited a sense, you know, for instance, in the UK um, of, you know, questioning our sense of normality, questioning a national narrative and a, a sense of being within the country about the direction of, of travel, the direction of time and of history to show that um, actually we are, there's nothing inevitable um, about um, how history and how politics unfold on the one hand. And yet at the same time, when these dramatic outbreaks occur, we are beholden to a myriad range of uh, structures and infrastructures that condition our response to it. Um, and so if I were to expand some of the analysis that I developed here into something larger, then it does occasion this deeper thinking about, um, I think particularly how economy broadly conceived um, is so central um, to shaping both when an epidemic occurs and what response looks like. And in the book, I do of course, explore a lot of this, but I'm also interested in that in its close relationship with, with medicine and public health. Um, and my thinking increasingly gravitates towards what does this look like at a, at a more global scale um, in terms of the structuring of our global economy. You know, so we have the crisis, for instance, of supply chains, 
that marked the early part of the COVID-19 pandemic that kind of bears a parallel to the crisis of supply chains that played out on a micro scale um, during Zimbabwe's outbreak. Um, but we also have this bigger question about the very nature of global health uh, and how it's been um, during COVID-19 sort of subordinated to a kind of geopolitics, uh, you know, exemplified, of course, by the Trump regime withdrawing from um, the World Health Organization, but also around the challenges of, the, of Britain and the EU figuring out how to manage um, and to deliver vaccines. Um, the other issue that I wanted to kind of reflect on just a little bit more, um, I guess, I mean, it's, it's, it's partly again going back to, to, to Sloan's early remark about um, how the presence of cholera always tells a story, um, that its sheer occurrence ought to alert, alert us to some wider social facts. And in a sense, this is partly what I argue theoretically when I conceive of an epidemic as having multiple ontologies, because I argue that um, epidemics are biological entities or biosocial entities. You know, they spread through given sorts of populations um, in excess of normal expectancy in a socially patterned way. And yet when we think of them as having multiple ontologies, that invites us to constantly ask, what does this epidemic tell us about uh, the moment of history that we're in or about the nature of uh, a host of political and economic arrangements. Now, something that struck me um, about the COVID-19 pandemic is its, its presence has been used to tell a story. It's actually a story that for much of the pandemic, I disagree with. And that story has been that, um, you know, the arrival of a new or exotic virus of pandemic potential and scale um, originates, you know, either from Africa or from Asia, um, and it travels through the circuits of global modernity, trade, finance, tourism, and economy. Um, when it arrives in Europe, as you know, COVID did this time last year, and begins to call um, unexpected and unconscionable suffering, this is treated as totally anathema to um, a kind of Euro-modern self-conception. Yet at the same time, an accompanying part of this narrative has been um, the forecasting of catastrophe to occur in Africa. So Africa's place in the global story of pandemics is rewritten as being the sort of site of uh, pre-modern or primordial origin of disease to being the final frontier of COVID-19. So I've been you know, curating a host of headlines from the first sort of three to six months of the outbreak that have all been predicting how much damage COVID-19 is going to wreak an African a continent sort of woefully ill-equipped to handle it. Um, and yet I think that this scripting, this narrative, much like um, the scripts and narratives around the cholera outbreak are kind of disrupted by thinking about them in terms of their multiple modernities and thinking about the contingency of factors that shape um, the historical and political trajectory um, of, of an outbreak. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of pause on these reflections here and, and um, allow kind of Jan and Sloan to, to, to respond. Uh, well, if I may take Chair's prerogative and respond first, and then I'll turn over to Jan. Um, uh, wonderful. I mean, a couple of points that I, I will bring out in response, Simukai. One is um, talking about, you know, kind of cholera is emblematic, as you say, and, you know, um, we haven't explicitly said it yet, but, you know, imagery and it's something I kind of refer to in the examples you bring out of the idea of what cholera represents in terms of imagery um, in the sense of kind of backwardness. Um, and so many of these things are, are the kinds of images, commentaries, symbols that outsiders put onto often African countries or environments, resource poor environments or anywhere where there is um, something like this, a disease outbreak. So these are, out, these are metaphors and symbols used by kind of outsiders. What I find interesting about one of the perspectives that you bring with this study that's unique, I think, um, is this sense of the self-reflection of a nation, of Zimbabwe having to, you know, even starting with kind of post-2000 politics, so before we get to this point of internalization perhaps, internalizing kind of 
uh, national identity and, you know, where are these politics going? This is not what was promised. This is not the trajectory we thought we were on. Um, and um, it reminds me very much of an experience I had many years ago, my first African experience, which was Zaire, where I, I was there for a couple of years. Um, and one thing that struck me, um, and this is under the Mobutu regime, was how self-critical the Zaire Wa were. You know, so how, how critical they were of themselves and of Africa overall. And they used a lot of this kind of, um, these sort of symbols and um, this sort of language. And there is this, so I, um, it, what strikes me is that you are able to kind of bring a multi-layered sort of um, approach uh, or vision to um, the use of these symbols. And including the damage that it, it, they do beyond the kind of failed state narrative. Um, and the, the second thing I'll just briefly comment on is um, obviously looking at um, our current situation, the current pandemic, and absolutely right. I mean, the and I, I have to admit, I worried about this myself, the idea that what's going to happen in African countries. Um, I was in Kenya in February last year. So just like a couple of weeks before borders started to shut. And um, I was worried. I had visited a couple of huge, densely packed slum communities, and they were absolutely massive. Um, and, you know, with infrastructure problems and so forth. And I couldn't help but think about those communities and think, what is going to happen? Well, the opposite happened, just as you uh, remark that the devastation we're seeing right now due to corruption, due to incompetence, due to a lack of will is in the United States for one thing. Um, and uh, this kind of trajectory of the, the, the power of these symbols and this internalized failed state narrative, even when it hasn't happened yet, is incredibly powerful. And I think it's very important um, that one, that people read this very topical book that you've just written, but also that, yeah, we, we use history and we pay attention. It's what we tell our students. When you read the news, kind of apply the same principles you would apply to critiquing evidence uh, from the past and kind of rework these narratives um, and really work with the evidence. So that, that's quite important work, I think, that you're doing right now. Um, but let me turn over to Jan for his commentary as well. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, this is also just going to be a slightly free-floating response to what you both just said. Um, and thanks for uh, also raising this question of the imagery, uh, Sloan. Because um, when I heard you respond, uh, and also thinking back to the book, uh, I mean, A, this question of the economy being central to how an epidemic, or in this case, a pandemic is unfolding. I think Sloan's, Sloan's remark about the US or the UK for that matter um, is, is, um, is quite spot on. And I think it speaks to this um, persistent representations of Africa uh, as, as you said, the final frontier. And I think this is something we see not only in medicine, but also generally when we think, for example, about climate change and climate risk. Um, Africa is this final frontier where, you know, cities and populations are constantly scripted as being at the same time the most exposed and the most vulnerable, the least well equipped to resist or to deal with the crisis. And I think if, you know, I think generally Africa, African studies as area studies and as a discipline always has a bit of a, a problem of legitimacy, you know, why study Africa from Europe, but part of the mission of studying Africa, um, not, you know, talking about Africa to people who might not um, know its realities so well is precisely counteracting, uh, counteracting those ideas. And I think what Sloan mentioned, the, the sort of the, the critical self-reflection of your informants about the state of the Zimbabwean state and the polity is, is precisely um, also giving voice to that. Um, and the other, um, the other thing I found interesting is also when in your response you started reminiscing about, about your upbringing and this, um, 
sense of progress like there's a sense to history right there's a there's a national destiny and i think this is something we can observe across southern africa these post-liberation regimes they they very strongly work with that we liberated the nation we you know there's a sense to history there's 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 a direction and this sense of suspension that you that you experienced yourself perhaps from a distance but that you that you chronicle so chronicle in your book um shows in many ways how pervasive this narrative is and how it resonates with citizens' expectations. And it does make me wonder, and not just for Zimbabwe, you know, what um, is, is our only chance to sort of step out of this dominant narrative, a, a generational change? Like, will, will this narrative, because in your last chapter, there's one, one of your informants is like, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm married to Mugabe till we die. Um, is, is this only going to change once these old dinosaurs have all died out? Or is there any, is there any scope for an articulation of alternative political terrains outside that framework of national, you know, a teleology that is shaped by the liberation struggle um, even now while, while those players, those political actors are still so, so much very dominant in, in the framework of formal politics? Uh, Simakai, why don't you give a, a brief response and then we're going to open up uh, to a Q&A with uh, the audience and I'll bring Professor Williams back. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it very, very brief. I mean, I think that the two big ideas that I'm, I'm sort of thinking about now in terms of my future work, um, one is about um, anticipating catastrophe in Africa and trying to understand and historicize that a bit more, particularly with respect to, to, to epidemics and thinking about um, the machinery that um, creates these discourses and how they, 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 they move around. And at the same time, um, because Sloan, I did share your concern. I was like, you know, what happens when COVID-19 hits Zimbabwe, for example? And, and, and to be honest, um, it is quite disastrous in many ways. I mean, the people in, you know, our hospitals are so ill-equipped that when people do get sick and are at that level, it's more or less a death sentence. There's something else that's going on socially, demographically, geographically, that is mitigating this, as well as a degree of noose and kind of seeing what was happening in Europe and putting certain kinds of measures in place. And so there's a, a tension between the anticipating catastrophe as a kind of forward projected, um, you know, uh, event in a future that may or may not come. Um, and then the kind of iterative um, everyday sense of living with crisis and how that reconfigures the ways in which people make sense of and adapt to uh, these potential moments of catastrophe. And to me, there's a real kind of puzzle about what all of that kind of looks like. The other issue is um, that I'm thinking about kind of quite immediately um, is about the born free generation in Southern Africa, uh, in Zimbabwe, and in my own life quite specifically. So with, with, with my sort of non-pandemics hat on, um, I have been writing increasingly about um, the afterlife of colonialism and how it um, uh, leaves an imprint in, in so many spheres of social life in Zimbabwe and in Britain and uh, schooling, our uh, language, um, and our sense of orientation both uh, to time and to history. And how my generation uh, of Zimbabweans is starting to, to rethink the logics of all of that and not quite knowing what to do with ourselves as we feel a kind of joint frustration uh, uh, being caught in the middle of so many different things. Um, uh, the recognizing the importance of liberation, but seeing the failures of the post-liberation uh, dream, um, recognizing the sinister nature of uh, British imperialism, and while at the same time valorizing um, many aspects of liberal democracy in the West. Um, and so those are kind of the two pillars of things that I'm, I'm thinking about. Great, thank you. Well, I think we have to, um, we still have a bit of time, but I'm going to ask um, Professor Williams to rejoin us, and he is going to um, handle questions from the audience. Thank you. Hello, thank you all. That was a, a really, really interesting discussion, and um, quite a few of the questions I had as a non-Africa specialist and actually as an early modernist um, uh, have come up here, really, which is about, you know, 
does disease or does does some does an epidemic always tell a story? And um, what are the kinds of political subjectivity that get generated by these kinds of crises? Um, are are questions that I think go. I mean, what's great about today is that you've tied them into a very particular moment, but they clearly also um, go in all sorts of different directions, and including the one that we're in right now. Um, but to, to honor the question, there's a question in, I don't know if you can see the questions as well or whether you're looking at the chat, but to save you doing so, there's um, a question from Philip Little, um, who asks, or who says that we rarely recognize or acknowledge the reality of an epidemic until we're confronted with sick bodies. In a way, it goes back to Sloan's point about the imagery of a pandemic. And, and clearly a sick body of a certain kind is, is part of the, the imagery of the pandemic. The question here is, do you think this is ever gonna change? And if so, how? In other words, imagery as opposed to causes. I think what the question is, why can't we see causes until we see the bodies? Um, so the, the, that's a really, it's a really powerful quote that um, Sloan kind of you know, lifted from Charles Rosenberg, which I, which I put in the book um, about political authorities kind of reacting to epidemics at that point where the sheer scale of horror is undeniable. Now, I think there's, there's a very particular um, answer to this from the Zimbabwean context, which I think is kind of illuminating of wider context. One of the challenges about writing a book like this was that, you know, the epidemic began in 2008 and um, it sort of ostensibly ended in 2009. I did the bulk of the research for it in 2015 in terms of the field work, and it was published in, in 2020. Now, when I was doing the research, um, it was very hard not to have the bias of retrospect because, you know, every testimony I gathered, particularly from my expert interviews uh, in the UN and in the Ministry of Health and so on, you know, had these screaming kind of red flags saying that, you know, this is going to be a disaster. So when I you know, would sit in minister's office, they would tell me quite candidly, you know, this was the information coming through. And um, I was like, well, why didn't you guys react? I mean, it was so clear that it was gonna be a disaster. And another thing that sort of came out was, well, you know, when you're receiving that information in real time of you know, more and more cases spreading, you don't at that moment know quite how this is all going to unfold. And one senior government official insisted to me that, you know, we had had scares like this multiple times. We had had scares in 2000 and every year since then before 2008. And we would get to a few hundred cases of cholera. We didn't necessarily react um, because we were quite incapacitated and it never turned into a major outbreak. And then in 2008, it did. Um, and so there's a kind of epistemological question, if you like, you know, how do we know um, a disaster is occurring when it's occurring? And in a sense, Rosenberg is suggesting that we know this, at, particularly at a political level, when it's undeniable, at which point a lot of harm has already occurred. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of caught in this um, uh, logical sort of trap. All of that said, I think, you know, particularly as has been the case with COVID, but not only, we're seeing across the world very different logics about um, the nature of preparedness um, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the logics of response. So, you know, the dilemma that I've kind of outlined is not really an inevitable. In the case of the Zimbabwean government, there was um, the fact of cholera was, you know, to be to, 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 to kind of misappropriate um, Al Gore was an inconvenient truth. Um, you know, there was um, a political kind of uh, negotiation for the formation of a government of national unity after a heavily disputed election in which the reputation of the ruling party was in tatters. To acknowledge an outbreak, uh, particularly one of that, 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 that potential scale, um, would have desperately undermined their politi political legitimacy even further. And so I think that this um, Rosenberg's insight needs to be taken that, that step further to say that the recurrence of this pattern is often about the, the, the forms of political will, but really unpacking, you know, what are the historical and political contingencies that are playing out at that time? And what can we also learn from the cases where radical preparedness is, is kind of mobilized um, instead of waiting to see how it unfolds? Mm 
Thank you. I don't know whether Jan or Sloan want to add to that particular point or whether we should move on. Sloan, you're muted if you do. Yeah. Um, I would just uh, add one maybe quick um, uh, counter example or, um, you know, thinking about Kenya, uh, Simakai mentioned, you know, the, the idea of preparedness and <coughs> how we kind of predict disaster in Africa, where we don't predict it elsewhere. And in the case of Kenya, um, you know, one perspective was the youthfulness of the population is one of the reasons why comparatively there seem to be faster deaths, more deaths in places like the UK or, or the US, and that that's what was protecting Kenya. What they didn't mention was Kenya closed their borders. Mm -hmm. Kenya actually took action before, we still haven't closed them here entirely. So, you know, there, there's also the sense of you don't know what you're missing and it's really difficult to kind of check those biases. And that's where I think where history helps us, where anthropology helps us to check those biases so that you're asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. So yes, something they can't help like the youthfulness of the population, but not the actual actions that a state took. Mm -hmm. I'm struck that these are, as you call them, ep um, epistemological questions, but in a way they are also uh, medical questions in terms of diagnosing, if you like, the body politic and what the signs are as to where where things are wrong and, and, and so on. Um, I'm sure you medical historians have to worry with the likes of me saying the body politic all the time, but it's, it's nonetheless, I think, an interesting uh, way of thinking about where, if you like, the procedures of medicine, so diagnosis and, and so on and prediction are actually embedded in the problem, um, it, it seems to me. Um, one other question, because, <clears throat> um, I mean, this is me thinking about some other discussions that were going on underneath this same umbrella. So a couple of months ago now, Hami Baba was talking about mobilizing unpreparedness as a kind of political uh, device. And I, I, I think it's just another way of thinking about this, the degree to which being unprepared um, is also a sort of political move in relation to a crisis, crisis thinking. Um, uh, and I'll do a little plug if anybody wants to hear that, uh, see that, it's it's on the website too. As I've done that, great, another question has come in. Um, the book describes different kinds of political subjectivity the outbreak engendered. Have these subjectivities developed since the outbreak or have they even been actively subverted or rejected by Harari's residents since then? In other words, how long does change last, I guess, is partly what that question is asking. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when, when I was doing interviews with people in the high density townships that were epicenters of the outbreak, um, there was a lot of trial and error in figuring out how you talk about the outbreak. And my initial strategy was to ask people kind of quite directly about it. So I, you know, I told them who I was and say, you know, this is the thing I'm researching. Can you tell me about your experience of that? Uh, very quickly, I realized that that did not work well and that what worked better was you know everybody would sort of stop me and say you know before we talk about cholera we need to talk about how hungry we were um and they want to talk about the food insecurity and malnutrition and so on and just even before we get into the more medical sort of side of it just the sheer um if you like social trauma of what it means to go hungry, to watch your family go hungry. Everyone wanted to start there. Then they wanted to talk about the violence. And then after they talked about the uh, hunger and political violence, then they wanted to talk about the outbreak. And so the commonality between these different frames was a kind of diagnosis on the part of citizens of things that have gone wrong at the level of the state. And indeed many people saw Mugabe's government and the, the ruling party's regime as a kind of sinister entity. And so the outbreak became this kind of um, event that both like kind of tied together all of these different phenomena and became um, a kind of easy way of saying, you know, this outbreak shows us all of the things that were, were, were wrong. Um, and at the same time, it didn't kind of stand apart in anybody's interpretation from the myriad other political, economic, and social changes that had taken place in their lives. And so the, the, 
the subjectivity as such, the way of thinking about politics that had really shifted from one that we kind of talked about earlier, the post-liberation ideology that Zimbabwe was developing and on the path of progress had shifted in, in particular ways to a sense that um, our ruling party is sinister, you know, at least in that kind of corner of people, and that disasters are necessarily politically produced. Some of this goes along the lines of a more conspiratorial line, um, and others are just lay the blame squarely um, at those who govern. Um, and that was one of the key shifts. And that hasn't really changed since then. Um, I think because people read it against the party and less so against Robert Mugabe um, per se. Again, Jan or Sloan, do you wish to say anything more to that? Um, or have you got questions yourselves that you'd like to pick up on? You're both muted, but. Well, I, I don't want to dominate. Jan, do you have, would you like to cap off with any questions? We've got three or four more minutes. If there's, if there's one more thing to say or one more thing that arises before we start, before we wind up. It's, it's not so much, um, it's not so much a question, but um, I was, I was, um, I was intrigued by uh, what you just mentioned now, this conspiratorial mode of thinking and how, um, on the, on the one hand, it's quite obvious that in such a moment of crisis, and, and, and we know that also from history, right, people, people seek to find who is, like, who's guilty, right, they, they need to find someone who, to, to blame. But um, also from the Angolan experience, I also wonder whether this is not uh, also something that is very typical to these post-liberation regimes. The, the cultivation of paranoia, of suspicion, of the, the, the suspecting of internal enemies, and how that then, in such a moment of crisis, also makes the, the you know, responding to the crisis, acknowledging the crisis, uh, so much more difficult. What you actually chart in your book, how, how difficult it was for the government to even declare an emergency. Um, and yeah, I don't know exactly where the question is in this, but but I think, you know, there's, there's something in, in there, in this conspiratorial mode, of thinking that is very typical to to this context that we're that we're observing here. If I can just add, I also had sort of a question that I initially wrote about distrust and how distrust is played out. The same as, as Jan it brings up uh, throughout the book, including uh, yeah manipulation of the truth, kind of the fake news of mm -hmm. you know where uh, the pandemic came from or where the epidemic came from. Mm -hmm. So Simica, go for it. You're, you're, you've got the last, you've got the stage for the last few minutes. Where yeah. you going? Um, so one of the tropes that came out a lot when I asked people where they thought cholera came from was um, they said that the, the that it had come from China, mm. um, and there were several reasons why they thought this. The, the government had initially tried to deflect attention away from itself and blamed it on the British. They said that cholera was racist, terrorist, biological warfare um, to undermine Zimbabwean sovereignty. Now, this had been a long-standing trope since 2000 to blame all of the country's internal problems on the history of colonialism. Um, at the same time, um, uh, Western investment, uh, the visible presence of Western companies and firms had been withdrawing from the country, while more and more Chinese firms and products were flooding the markets and had a more visible presence in the city. And people know that there is a deeper history of the liberation struggle in which the ruling party had received arms and support from the Chinese. And so this sense that and the, the, the globalized nature of our history of struggle has always been in tension between East and West, um, then became reappropriated into kind of daily social metaphors that people were using. And um, it was also a way of saying that, look, you know, back to these kind of tensions of modernity, the, the clear sign that we are no longer modern, that we're no longer making uh, progress is that we've been rejected by the West. Um, our government says, it's because of sanctions and an attack on us, but we think it's because 
um, you know, we, we have been rejected and they're turning to China to support it. But everybody knows that China can't possibly as, be as good as Britain in terms of the provision of you know, clean water or whatever it is. So, you know, all of these narratives are like swirling around um, amongst each other and they kind of came out. And I, I think that it could be the basis of its own discussion. And I, I kind of don't go quite as deeply into it in the book, but it was definitely a kind of striking feature, essentially that the content of conspiracy was very much rooted into competing interpretations of history. You'd think after all this time you'd learn to unmute yourself and also not put your your notes in front of the camera. But anyway, um, uh, as you say, we could we could carry on for another hour, I'm sure. But um, our time's up, and I just wanted to conclude by thanking. You, Sloan, you, Jan, um, and uh, most of all, you, Sam Mackay, for writing the book that, that brought us all together here today. Um, thank you also for all the, those of you who've been uh, listening, posting questions, or just plain listening and, and I'm sure thinking along with us. Um, let's hope to see you again at the next book at lunchtime. Um, and uh, I won't go into details, they're all on the website. But most of all, thanks again to all three of you. Um, good afternoon and goodbye. Thank <clears> you. <throat>